I try to sort a variety of cultural and social practices into things that we believe travel with some difficulty, that are difficult to move from their local origins to other places, and then uh, to some other sorts of practices. So one thing is uh, that is thought to move with great difficulty are customs and manners. If you learn to use a fork like an American, it's very difficult to learn to use a fork like a French person or a, a British person. It's very difficult to get jokes. I've been to cinemas in Scotland where I lived for a long time where Woody Allen movies are not considered to be funny. <laughs> it's called New York humor. Learning a language is an example of something that moves with great difficulty. Uh, other sorts of things are religious feelings and moral sensibilities. The cleanness or the uncleanness of pork, uh, the exposing of breasts as an erotic sign or as quite ordinary, and of course believing in another god. And finally, things like, uh, like tastes. Again, I lived in Scotland and people like something called haggis, which I've described it to you might create a certain amount of nausea. <laughs> if you live in Scandinavia, there's something called lutefisk. If you've ever tried it, it's very nasty. <laughs> uh, there's a Taiwanese specialty that I've tried to like, stinky tofu, and failed to like. So all of these things are things that, are, things that one could perhaps, with difficulty and over time, learn to alter, uh, but are difficult uh, to do so. By contrast, there are things that are thought, and I emphasize the thought to move quite easily uh, around the world. And these relate to my area of speciality. So for example, mathematical knowledge and skill. There are very famous stories about mathematicians from Isaac Newton in the 17th century to Ramunajan, the Indian uh, Ill semi-illiterate mathematician in the early 20th century, where the idea is that one can encounter mathematical axioms and mathematical texts and, and master the mathematics as an autodidact. One doesn't need a community of people, it is said. Uh, related things are, are logical thinking. It is said that, for example, the laws of non-contradiction are, are, uh, are, are universal, and many of the methods and the facts of, of the natural sciences. Now, true, you may have to be exposed to a text uh, in order to encounter these uh, principles, these modes of thinking, and, and these facts. But once it is said you encounter these texts, uh, then the principles of science, uh, of mathematics, uh, and of logic are universal. And so if we ask what is a, a universal, very many people point to things like this. And we say, perhaps in loose usage, that these are things which are universals as opposed to taste, custom, religion, and, and languages and things uh, like that. We say in a loose manner of usage that everyone knows or everyone believes, in spite of massive evidence to the contrary, that these things uh, may not be actually universal. Now the question that I'm encouraged to, to think about in this context is if we think about economic development, technology, transfer, what's it like? Is it to be understood on the model of things that move with great difficulty, like customs, tastes, and manners, or is it to be understood on the model of uh, an idea of, of mathematics uh, and, and science? Uh, this is one question we could pose. I think there's a slightly better version of that question, and, and that's this. Uh, supposing that the practices of economic development or technology transfer are like science, and here I throw a spanner in the works, what is science actually like? And how does science actually travel around the world. In other words, we have the idea of mathematics, logic, and science traveling in a frictionless medium around the world. And the question is, what do we know about how it actually does? So this is, I'm trying to move you onto the territory of people like me who have studied how science and, and technology actually move from place to place and are transmitted from time to time. Now there are people whose business it is to pronounce on what science is actually like in the circumstances of its movement. Uh, some of these people are historians of science, others people are sociologists of science, some of these people are philosophers, tend to be less interested in these sorts of questions, but taken together we could call this not science but meta-science, as we're thinking about the nature of science. That's quite a useful thing to do because so many of our cultural practices, not just those of economic development and, and technology transfer, piggyback, as it were, on an idea of what it is to be scientific. But there are people who spend a lot of time 
uh, trying to think about the, the concrete practices of scientific movement. Now, at a as a first cut, and this may not be apparent for many of the social science textbooks that people in this room encounter, there are a lot of philosophies of science. There are a lot of pictures of what science is like. Some are more familiar than others. And one first cut about in dividing these is there are rationalist philosophies of science or pictures of science in which all you need to know is that there's a clear, articulable, and universally efficacious scientific method. And if you follow that, then scientific knowledge will flow and will travel. Less well known, but more characteristic of developments in the history and sociology of science over the last uh, s several years is anti-rationalism. In other words, that these the scientific method is not a very good way of getting science to flow around the world. Uh, my, one of my favorite quotations, well, actually I sort of made it up partly myself, the American sociologist C. C. Wright Mills said, the problem with much human science, social science in the world, is that it had bought the wrong philosophy of, of science. And so one of the interesting things that uh, might have some value in this context is to point out the existence of anti-rationalist philosophies uh, of science which are less known in human science textbooks. Here are some of this is probably the most famous Harvard product, Thomas S. Kuhn's 1962 Structure of Scientific uh, Revolutions, which emphasized the importance of training and pedagogy in forming uh, scientists and in uh, socializing them into their paradigm. Kuhn actually drew upon the work of the Hungarian British physical chemist Michael Polanyi on the right, a book that he wrote some years before called Personal Knowledge. And a key concept which, uh, as I'll indicate, has got a lot of purchase on the understanding of technology transfer and economic development comes with or without opening the covers of this book from the work of Michael Polanyi. By the way, this is Michael Polanyi. People here might be more familiar with Carl Polanyi, his brother. And there is an interesting story that we can't tell here. Uh, and so the, uh, so the the phrase that one finds most commonly in the context of studies of economic development that traces back to philosophy of science is the notion of tacit knowledge, which of which the most popular aphoristic version is from Polanyi, we know more than we can say. Know how, as opposed to knowing that and knowing why. And examples of, of know-how would be riding a bike. You can tell someone how to ride a bike, but it's going to be ineffective unless they have the experience of riding a bike themselves, playing the piano, making a souffle. And Polanyi's claim is that tacit knowledge is informal, anti-rational, embodied way of, uh, of uh, understanding science and acquiring scientific skills is an ineliminable part of doing science uh, I itself. Now, there's a very interesting passage from Polanyi's personal knowledge which indicates, because Polanyi was not only his brother's brother, but someone who's, who was interested in political economy even before he did philosophy of science, and that's his experience in industry. So there are plants that know how to make light bulbs effectively in Germany. He was involved in this, transplanted at, w with a key, as it were, to, to Hungary. It didn't work. And this kind of experience is the experience that's much reflected upon by historians and sociologists of science. So we have got lots and lots and lots of examples now of the how, as it were, the methods and materials section of scientific papers are in themselves ineffective in transmitting scientific skill around the world. We have studies for the British sociologist Harry Collins who studied the transmission of laser building skills. And the point that Harry Collins make, which has been confirmed again and again and again, unless you were present at the origin site of laser building, all attempts to build a laser failed. So you have to move people, as Ricardo suggested around. And when you move the people to the original laser building site, the skills are effectively transmitted. In the 17th century, I myself studied the transmission of air pump building skills. And we actually diagram the flow of, of movement of people and movement of texts. And again and again, the only way to learn how to build uh, an air pump uh, effectively is to be in a place where air pumps were being built. The methods of material section, as it were, uh, did not uh, work. Part of the lesson that Polanyi's making on here, this experience could be passed on only by example from master to impressions, and he goes on to say, and it's costly and it's time consuming. 
But what Plani is indicating, and I think the evidence that Ricardo and his colleagues have presented, it may be costly and it may be time consuming, but it may be much more effective than buying in a rationalist philosophy of science, whereby knowledge moves not from person to person, but by text to text. That tends not to work very well. Thank you.